Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last session of the scintillating um, COSINE main meeting. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome the first speaker of the afternoon session, uh, Dr. Pamela Reinagle. Hi, um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to give you the gist of a project that we're doing in my lab that has to do with um, what determines a rat's willingness to do work to get water. So in the field of neuroeconomics, there's been an immense amount of research devoted to understanding how an animal or a person um, represents the relative values of the different options uh, in its environment and how that mediates their ability to choose between them. Compared to this, there's been very little research into the question of how the animal decides whether it's worth it or not to collect a reward if there's only one option available. Um, and uh, some of the studies, uh, few studies that have been done, uh, the general uh, result is that if there's only one option available, for example, a uh, task that an animal can do to earn water, the response vigor, the likelihood or frequency with which they'll pursue that task, is, uh, tracks the expected value of the reward that the animal would receive. And this makes sense, but we know that that can't be the whole story because on ecological timescales, the affordances of the environment can change much too slowly for the animal to be able to afford to wait around for some other more appealing option to appear. So this is a creek bed during the recent drought in California, and if a rat has to forage for water in this environment, it's gonna have to be willing to work harder than ever exactly under the circumstance when the rewards are smaller than ever. So um, this is a question that we got interested in modeling in my lab. And to study this, we're gonna take advantage of this um, automated uh, live-in training environment that we've had in my lab for quite some time now, um, in which every rat in my lab has a computer attached to its home cage. This computer has three lick sensors, which is how the animal can operate the computer and they're able to perform tasks, um, various psychophysical tasks, in order to earn water rewards. So the experiment is extremely simple. We're going to assign some uh, psychophysical task, and we're gonna hold the difficulty of that task fixed for the entire experiment. And what we're gonna vary is the reward size, or to be precise, the expected reward. Um, so at the time the animal's deciding, do I feel like doing the task or not, um, the amount of reward that they can predict they will receive on average from performing one trial. And what's unique about this experiment compared to the previous ones is that we're gonna hold that reward size constant for a long period of time, like two or three weeks. Um, so the animal has to adapt its behavior appropriately. He has to uh, uh, devote the appropriate amount of vigor to this activity. Um, uh, under a, that's sustainable for a long period of time. And we're simply gonna measure the trial rate that the animal chooses to do at steady state under this reward environment. Um, and we're gonna require that that animal's behavioral strategy is sustainable for the animal. So the animal's not losing weight, they're not becoming dehydrated, they can go on like this for weeks and presumably indefinitely. So um, to cut quickly to the result, um, these are results from five rats. Uh, and you won't be surprised to learn that under these circumstances where the time constant is very slow, um, rats are willing to work harder exactly when the reward is smaller. So when the expected reward uh, for doing a trial is very large, like 75 microliters, a rat might only do 50 or 100 trials a day um, of this effortful work. But when the reward size gets very small, they'll do many hundred or in some cases more than 1,000 trials a day um, of work motivated to earn water. So they're appropriately modulating their effort allocation. Um, and while this wasn't really um, handled in the previous studies of, a reward big, of effort allocation, um, it has an obvious explanation. The animal has to maintain homeostasis. It needs a certain amount of water to survive. And he's just gonna do as many trials as he has to to get the amount of water that he needs. And if that explained the data, then we would expect that these curves would follow a one over X um, shape. And uh, if we were just to multiply the expected reward or the average reward per trial by the number of trials that were done, um, we should see that the total amount of water that the animal earned was constant, but that's not what we see. So on the bottom, we're seeing um, results, uh, the same results as above, but now uh, I've just replotted them as the total yield or the total amount of water that that animal worked to receive in a day. 
And here we see that the easier it is to get water, so the bigger the reward for doing one trial, uh, the more total water the animal's willing to work to earn. Um, and I want to emphasize again that if you go to the very left side of this graph where the expected reward for a trial is 10 microliters or less, the animals are working extremely hard to get that amount of water, about 10 mils a day. That amount was completely sufficient for that animal to maintain homeostasis. Um, they were completely, they didn't lose weight, they were not clinically dehydrated, so that amount of water is enough. But if you look at that rat with the yellow curve, um, it was willing to do work to earn three times more water than he needed if that work uh, wasn't too onerous. So in economics, uh, the result that's shown on the top panels is known as backbending labor supply, um, which in the 1800s was an initially um, confusing finding that if you increase the wage rate, the labor supply sometimes decreases. And this is explained by the fact that at some point workers would rather have more leisure time than earn more. Um, and the phenomenon on the bottom is known in economics as elasticity of demand, the principle that the total uh, consumption or demand for a commodity um, can depend on its cost, in this case the cost in labor to the rat of getting it. As a quick aside, um, the fact that we see elasticity of demand for water was something of a surprise. In an economics textbook, water is often given as the canonical example of the sort of commodity that's not elastic because it's essential for survival. Um, uh, but since we do see elasticity of demand, at least in rats, uh, it led to a practical consequence um, that you can train animals for water rewards without water restricting them, which I won't have time to talk about, but that's a published paper. So since economics already came up with a formal theory to explain these phenomena more than 100 years ago, I figured I'd just steal their equations. Um, I'm not gonna have time to get into the math. I'd be happy to talk afterwards to anyone who wants to. Uh, I'm just gonna comment that we're going to model this as a utility maximization problem, where utility is just the subjective value to the individual of anything in the arbitrary units we call utils. And here I'm showing the, um, an example of the curve, type of curve we use to represent the utility of water. Um, so on the x-axis is the total amount of water a rat consumes in a day, and on the y-axis is what value the animal assigns to getting that amount of water in a day. And we just chose a functional form that constrains that getting no water is no good, more water is better, uh, it's a diminishing return, and there's a point at which the rat has drunk as much water as it wants to, and if you made it drink any more water, it would actually be less happy or um, physiologically worse off. So in other words, um, we chose a form of the utility equation that has a maximum. And uh, the consequence of that is if we assumed animals were just trying to maximize their utility of the water they consumed, um, the number of trials they would have to do to get that amount of water will depend on the reward size, which is color-coded here. Um, and so the maximum utility, or the peak in this curve, will occur at a different point uh, along the x-axis. The optimal number of trials will vary depending on reward size, so that explains backbending labor supply easily. Um, but this still assumes or predicts that the animal will work until they get this fixed amount of water every day. To explain the um, elasticity of demand, um, we have to also add in uh, a cost term, which is um, the aversive nature of the effort. We know that the task is aversive or work to the animal because they won't do it if there's no reward, and they won't do it if they're not thirsty. So it's an aversive thing they don't like doing, and we put in a term for the sort of cumulative um, badness of having to do a certain number of trials, and we assume that these are balanced against each other um, to compute a total utility shown in the bottom graph, um, which is gonna depend again on the size of the rewards, and we're gonna assume that the animal's algorithm is to maximize their net utility by choosing the number of trials where the curve peaks for the reward size that it's currently experiencing. And if you find the peaks of those curves and plot them on the plots below, you'll see on the left, that the optimal number of trials that the animal should do to maximize utility does uh, fall off with the size of the reward, just as we saw with the rats, but now also the total amount of water that the rat would consume um, with that optimal utility solution is gonna increase with the size of the rewards, uh, eventually leveling off um, at whatever that amount of water was that was the maximum utility when water was free. Pretty much in the limit when reward size is infinite. Okay, so we have uh, equations um, that we already knew were able to fit data of this sort from economics, and sure enough, they can fit the data from rats very easily. So these uh, graphs show data from one rat. Every point is the average result from three days at steady state on a different reward level. 
Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and we have a more complex uh, form for this uh, equation with five parameters, but we only needed two free parameters actually to fit all of the data we've collected so far. And uh, in fact, one of those free parameters is constrainable experimentally. Uh, because you'll remember that if we looked at the maximum, uh, the utility of water curve, it has a maximum, the amount of water that the animal was optimally happy with. Um, and that's by definition the satiety point of the animal. So um, we can measure the satiety point very easily, just give the animal a water bottle and measure how much he'll drink in a day. Um, and that number turns out to be very different for different animals and explain most of the individual difference in the fits of this model. So here in the blue bars, we're seeing the amount of water that a rat will drink ad lib 24 hours a day. Uh, um, if it has access 24 hours a day, how much would it drink per day for eight different rats? And you can see they vary hugely from one rat to another. So that has to do with their different subjective value of the water. Um, uh, and so if we plug this into our equation, then we only have to have one free parameter to explain the behavior of the rat. Um, the other thing to notice here is that water satiety is schedule dependent. So if the animal has to get all this water in a two hour period every day, um, the, they still have unlimited access, the water is free, but they only can access it for two hours, then their daily consumption drops to these bars that are shown in red, a much smaller amount, again, sufficient for their um, sustained well-being and hydration, um, but, uh, but less than if they had 24 hours. And, and this is cool because it means that um, if we measure the animal's trial rate, their effort allocation in this situation where they can do the task 24 hours a day, we constrain the fit by the measured satiety, how much water they would drink in 24 hours if it was free, um, we can fit the model to the data with only one free parameter, and then without any free parameters, we should be able to predict their trial rate on some other schedule. All we need to know is what is their measured satiety for water on that schedule. And so um, this is a summary um, of a lot of experimental data, eight different rats. Um, and here, again, the blue points show um, measured effort allocation at different uh, different reward rates, each one of which was uh, measured at steady state over a period of a couple of weeks. Uh, the blue curve shows the fit of the model through the points for the 24 hours. The red points show the trials that the animal did if they only had two hours a day to do all of their work and earn all of their water. So it's still the number of trials they'll do in a day and the number amount of water they'll drink in a day, but it's just constrained to a different schedule. Um, and then the red curve is the same model as shown in blue, just substituting in um, the measured satiety point with no free parameters. So the point is that this model can explain um, the animal's behavior quite well. It's very parsimonious with um, one measured fact about each rat, which is its water satiety, and one free parameter for each rat. Um, we can predict how many trials it's going to do on any reward rate on any schedule. And as an aside, this has been very handy for optimizing training of animals and other experiments in our lab. Um, but, um, but where do we take it from there? So in describing the model, um, I talked about uh, curves for the total utility of doing a certain number of trials. Um, but now I want to shift perspective and describe the identical model instead in terms of the marginal utility. So this is just the derivatives of the curves at left. And so instead of asking, how much would a rat value the water it got at after four, 500 trials? We're gonna ask, um, if the rat has already done 499 trials, how much additional value would it assign to getting one more reward by doing the 500th trial? So, and the same thing for the effort. Not how much do I mind doing 1,000 trials, but how much will I mind doing the 1,000th trial? And the reason for doing this is because this allows me to take a static model, which is an equilibrium model that just accounts for the total amount of effort the animal will do in a day, um, and turn it into a dynamical model, because I'm gonna interpret this marginal utility now as a time-varying quantity um, that represents the animal's instantaneous to do drive, drive to do work at any moment. So at any given moment, however many trials the animal has done already, um, it just has to evaluate um, how much would it value one more drop of water right now? How much would it mind doing one more trial right now? And on balance, would the value of that water outweigh the cost of that effort? So now the animal doesn't have to hold a model of this curve and find the maximum of it. It just has to compute this local fact and decide if it's a positive number. And I'm gonna postulate that the animal, uh, if 
is just going to allocate effort or vigor in proportion to this marginal net utility. So if it's negative, um, they won't work at all. Uh, and if it's positive, they'll work with a vigor that tracks um, that utility. And you can see that if we fit the equations to the static equilibrium data, these curves drop off incredibly steeply, right? And in fact, I cut off the scale on the left because it would have gone off the top of the slide. Um, so the value, the marginal net utility of the first trial is almost infinite. The animal is super thirsty and they're not at all tired. Um, but it plummets incredibly fast so that after they've done just a few trials, the marginal net utility is predicted to be far lower. And that's exactly what we see if we look at the dynamics of when in a session the animals will choose to do their trials. So here um, I'm showing data from uh, a two hour session and uh, the trial rate is extremely high in the beginning. In fact, I think the height of that peak is truncated because the animal physically can't do trials any faster than that. Um, but after a relatively small number of trials early in the session, the, their effort allocation um, plummets to a far lower level um, as the marginal utility uh, curves predict. Um, but that raises the question, why does the marginal utility or the trial rate fall as much as it does? It doesn't uh, immediately make sense. Um, so 15 minutes into a session, this animal would have only consumed about three or four mils of water, and that water wouldn't still not have had time to reach its bloodstream. So its hydration state hasn't even begun to change. So it's not the case that the marginal utility is tracking the animal state of hydration. Um, it's tracking something else, and we're gonna suggest that what marginal utility ought to track is the predicted future need for additional water. And, um, and the shape of this curve gave us a hint where we think this is being computed in the brain, and I'm gonna suggest uh, that this quantity is being calculated by um, the glutamatergic neurons in the subfornical organ, or SFO. Um, and I only have time to give you a couple of the reasons for thinking so. Um, so SFO neurons drive drinking behavior. If you optogenetically stimulate them, an animal who's fully hydrated will uh, drink water. Um, and uh, at the left side of this slide illustrates that um, as water is consumed, there's a slow process whereby it's absorbed into the body and systemic hydration gradually increases, um, which will ultimately restore the normal osmolarity of the blood and re uh, eliminate the signal that's driving this. Um, and that pathway would result in the effort allocation, which is shown in the blue curve in the little graph at the bottom there, um, falling off in proportion to the animal's hydration state. But what's observed uh, in the uh, behavior is quite different. Uh, animals will shut down their drinking behavior after only a few minutes and far before they become hydrated. And the recent work, elegant work from several other labs, has really recently worked out the circuit for this, which is shown on the right hand of the slide. There are proprioceptive and uh, sensory neurons uh, not fully identified yet in the mouth, the oropharyngeal sensory neurons um, that send a feedback signal um, uh, through at least partly identified neural pathway. Um, that essentially detects that the animal has swallowed water and sends back the signal um, to SFO to shut off its firing and that results in the animal stopping drinking. So the SFO does not represent the animal's hydration state. It has an input that detects that state, um, but what its firing rate represents is the instantaneous estimate of the predicted future value of consuming more water. So it's exactly what marginal net utility should be computing. Just to give one other uh, detail about um, why these neurons are a good candidate, we can blow up the temporal dynamics of the behavior even further. And we can see that the, um, <clears throat> uh, on the left there, we have the average trial rate as a function of time in a two hour session. And below we have a raster that shows when each trial was performed in a session for a dozen or so sessions of the same animal. And you can see that their effort allocation does not fall off smoothly, as the curve above might suggest, but rather it comes in these bouts or um, clumps uh, where it'll do a, drink a, a bunch or do a bunch of trials and then take a break and then do a bunch more. And I think my abstract mentioned that we have uh, an HMM model that can uh, fit this very well um, by assuming that the animal is switching between a rest state and a work state uh, and then emitting trials in the work state um, in proportion to um, the marginal net utility. And then the switching between states is also driven by the marginal net utility. Um, but not, while that formally accounts for the data, I think we have a better explanation now, um, which is illustrated on the right-hand side. If you blow up the detail of the firing rate of these SFO glute neurons, 
Um, here, the vertical red lines, um, which are very fine, um, represent individual licks. Um, these data were recorded from a, a mouse in the night lab, um, and this mouse is getting its water for free. It's just looking out of a bottle, so I'm um, making a leap um, here. But what you can see is that um, when uh, the animal starts drinking, which is shown by the vertical uh, thick red, red line, it, uh, it it drinks a lot, and this causes the neurons firing rate to plummet, but then it stops, and the neurons firing rate rebounds a little bit, and then it begins drinking again, and so it has this oscillatory uh, firing rate that it underlies the oscillatory um, behavior allocation. Um, and the dynamics of that fluctuation is being driven by the, um, the feedback loop that I told you about that measures the, the oral signals of having consumed water and also uh, a slightly slower loop that goes through the gut that I didn't have time to talk about. And so we think that we can account for the temporal dynamics of the animal's effort allocation in detail with a model that we could fit with only one free parameter based on the equilibrium average number amount of effort allocation uh, that it performed in a day. Um, and just reminding you that when we fit that model, there was no information available about the timing of trials uh, within a session uh, or the temporal structure of it with which that effort is allocated. And since people have done uh, quite a lot of work on this circuit, um, this makes many very testable predictions, uh, some of which we have uh, done and I didn't have time to talk about and uh, others of which we're trying now. Um, so this was actually a single author paper, but um, I also want to mention uh, many fruitful discussions I've had with Mark Machina in our economics department and the many technicians and undergrads that did the hard work of weighing rats every single day for this project. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you, Pamela. Uh, we have time for a couple of quick questions. So, Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, so in general, a, a variable reward schedule uh, makes animals more motivated, and I'm wondering if your model explains why that is. Uh, no, we ha so we haven't um, manipulated um, the reward probability, uh, variability in the in the size, uh, delay, any of those things. Obviously, are other variables that we could uh, incorporate, um, and the answer is no, we haven't. We haven't put that in yet. Uh, let's thank our speaker and uh, take this discussion offline, if I may. Our next speaker is Philip Cohen. Great. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Um, I'd like to thank the organizers and my reviewers for giving me a chance to share my work with you all today. Uh, most of that work has been on trying different PowerPoint transition slides, <laughs> but I'm going to talk about a little side project that I've been doing on audiovisual integration. So audiovisual integration is a type of multi-sensory integration that we all do all the time, especially when we're in a noisy environment like one of these poster rooms, and we want to try and extract one stream of information from a background that's very noisy. But we don't really know which part of the brain is taking that auditory and visual information and combining it. And in particular, we don't know what the role of cortex is in this process. And so that's the question I wanted to look at using the mouse model system. And in particular, I'd like to ask and potentially even answer three questions for you today. The first is how do mice actually integrate auditory and visual information? Um, now, the simplest way we could imagine is perhaps an additive model where the mice simply combine the information of the two modalities, but maybe they're doing something a bit more complicated than that. Secondly, I'd like to know which regions of dorsal cortex are actually required to perform an audiovisual task. So from past literature, we might expect parietal cortex or early sensory cortex to have some involvement here, but we don't really know. And finally, I'd like to ask how do neurons in those regions actually encode audiovisual information? So to do any of those things, we need an audiovisual task. And the one I developed for mice works as follows. The mouse is sitting in a chamber with its forepaws resting on a wheel that it can turn to the left or to the right. And we present stimuli to these for auditory stimuli. Now the mice has to hold the wheel still for a few milliseconds in order to initiate a trial. And once it does that, it receives a stimulus, and it has 1.5 seconds to respond. 
Now the mouse's goal on each trial is to decide whether the stimulus is on the left or the right, and then turn the wheel to move that stimulus to the center of its environment. And if it does that correctly, it's gonna get a water reward. Now stimuli can be auditory, visual, or audiovisual, and when they're audiovisual, they can be coherent when both stimuli are on the same side, or conflicting when the stimuli are on different sides. And in conflicting trials, we reward the mouse randomly. So it's always in the mouse's best interest to make a guess and give a response. So what does the behavior actually look like? Well, here I'm showing you one mouse, and I'm showing you the trials when the auditory stimulus is in the center. So these are visual trials. And as I hope you can see, as the contrast increases to the right on the x-axis, the fraction of rightward choices also increases. It's a pretty standard psychometric curve, and we know how to fit visual tasks in our lab. We can use a pretty simple model where the log odds of choosing right are based purely on a bias term and a vision term. And there's only three fit parameters here, the bias parameter, the visual scaling parameter, and the contrast saturation parameter, and then we have our stimulus variable visual contrast. So if we put, uh, fit this model to this data, we do a fairly good job. So now we want to try and incorporate these auditory trials and see if we can still fit the mouse behavior. So let's start with the most simple auditory trials when the visual contrast is zero, and I'm showing you here the auditory right trials in red and the auditory left trials in blue. And the simplest way we can incorporate these into this model is just by adding an audition term that has just one more fit parameter, the auditory scaling, and one more stimulus variable, which is the auditory azimuth. And if we fit this model to this data, we're gonna get two new lines, a red one for auditory on the right, and a blue one for auditory on the left. So this is great, but now it makes a prediction that this model is fit only to the unisensory trials right now. If mice are really doing this additive computation where they add the contributions from visual and auditory, we should be able to fit every other trial on these lines, all the coherent trials and all the conflict multisensory trials. And in fact, that's exactly what we see. So for the few people that are still awake at this point in the conference, they might look at this and say, well, that's all well and good, but this seems like a mouse that's pretty evenly good at auditory and visual trials. And that's true. In fact, if we look at the ratio of these scaling parameters, it's pretty close to one, it's 1 1.3. So does a model like this hold for a mouse that's much better at visual trials than auditory or vice versa? So to look at that, I'm gonna show you 20 different mice here, starting with mice that have a very high uh, ratio for these scaling factors and going all the way down to 0.9. Capture 97% of the variance um, across mice. So hopefully this convinces you that mice are using this additive model in order to solve this task, but which regions of dorsal cortex are the mice actually using to do that? And to answer that question, we wanted to use an optogenetic inactivation strategy where we targeted different regions of dorsal cortex and inactiv inactivated them for the full duration of the response window. And then we want to know which regions, when we inactivate them, do we change the mouse's behavior. So to begin with, I'm gonna show you just the visual trials again. And what I'm showing you here is for each point in the brain, when we inactivated that point, um, what was the change in the fraction of rightward choices that the mouse made? And if the point is red, then it's an increase in fraction of rightward choices. And if it's blue, it's an increase in fraction of leftward choices. And what I hope you can see is that when we have C, is that in this case, M2 really has the most information about the upcoming choice of the mouse, and that's accuracy relative to baseline, where baseline is just a model that knows the bias of the mouse in each case. So with that, I'd just like to conclude and say that hopefully I've convinced you that mice are using an additive uh, computation in order to solve this task. It seems that auditory cortex and visual cortex are involved in auditory and visual trials, but if, within dorsal cortex, it seems like only M2 is actually required on every trial. And it's too early to say exactly what's going on in M2, but it does seem like it's doing something special, and hopefully I can come back next year and, and uh, tell you more about that. And so I'd just like to thank my co-authors again and thank you all for listening and uh, be happy to take any questions. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Well, I've got one for you. <laughs> How do you think your findings would generalize to a more complex cognitive task? 
Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I don't know is the short answer, but we are trying to modify this task to do some uh, different aspects, for example, switching, where perhaps we make it so that the mouse needs to pay attention to visual for a certain period of the task, and then switch to auditory and back again. Um, whether that will, again, involve just the regions that we found here, or whether we'll start to see recruitment of other uh, frontal regions, which is what the literature would predict, um, I don't know. But we do think that the, this basic task will provide a way to start asking um, questions about more complex decisions as well. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Uh, let's thank uh, Philip again. Our third speaker is Marton Hainal. Okay, uh, thank you, and hello everyone. Um, so let's um, start with um, with something that is look like um, an easy behavioral task, which is very common. So let's imagine it, like have to choose between a good and a bad outcome. Sensory uh, cues provide information, for example, here visual. Um, and the correct response is uh, rewarded. One way to think about this problem is the latent variable model, where when it learns, it predicts the outcome of the sensory cue. It predicts the outcome based on the sensory cue. So now let's imagine the task where the cue comes from another um, sensory modality, say audio, and we again learn to predict the outcome. When we learn each separately, then if the cues come separately, we will have no issues um, behaving optimally in each. However, if both sensory modalities are present, we do not know whether to listen to the visual or the audio cue. Um, we can reconcile this by learning to predict the outcomes based on the joint statistics of all the cues and rewards, and that is inferring the latent uh, tasks. But how to resolve a conflict case? If the environment is such that uh, the tasks are not independent, then we can describe the relation of the latent task variables with an even deeper latent variable. Let's call it context. Latent because we don't observe it directly. We can think about it as uh, context governs the relevance of the two sensory inputs. To test how an animal uh, would cope with this scenario, we designed an experiment with the simplest statistics in this latent context variable, a mutually exclusive cues. In the first half of the session, mice had to respond to the visual go signal, getting a reward, and withhold action to the no go signal. All this while ignoring the audio destructor. And then vice versa, in the other half of the session, respond to the audio go signal and ignore the visual destructor. It's important to note that visual and audio statistics are identical in both contexts. Both have 50% chance for any of their two possibilities in each trial. Also, the order of the attend visual or audio context is randomized across sessions. I also want to stress that this is not a rapid task switching paradigm. The benefit, benefit of this design is that there's no direct cue for the context in the trials. Animals have to infer it from the trial statistics. So this setup corresponds well to the scenario we started with. The combinations of task conditions can be broken down into um, multiple simple binary task variables. Left or right moving ratings, low and high tone, context of the relevant modality, and the choice the animal actually responds with, lick or withhold lick. How did the trial look like? It consisted of three seconds of simultaneous visual and audio stimuli, preceded and followed by inter -trial intervals. And these periods correspond to the evoked and spontaneous terminology. Okay, so now we the, this experimental design, the question is, how are these variables and their dependency structure represented in the brain? It's 
specifically, we, are, uh, we were initially interested in if we can measure any of the effect of the non-visual task variables, especially context, in the primary visual cortex. We used silicon probes getting around 10 to 50 single units per animal. Um, so let me show you a couple of single cell responses. Here in the rows, we see the activity of four selected neurons from a single animal. Spike counts averaged over trials with different values of the task variables. For example, in the first column, you can see that the go trials uh, are compared to the no go uh, and the other variables in the other columns. Apparently, in V1, all task variables seem to be represented. I conveniently order the cells so in the diagonal panels, you can see the highest difference in rates between the corresponding conditions. Observe that these cells respond more selectively to one of the variables. Most cells have mixed selectivity, though. So we should go beyond and analyze the population dynamics to reveal any correlations with and latent dynamics coded in a possibly in a distributed way. Um, so performing, for example, PCA on the population activity vector, orthogonal principal components will correspond to the strongest variabilities within the population as a whole. Projecting spike counts onto these principal components, and again, averaging over trial conditions, we see that the trajectories can markedly differ. So there is definitely something consistent going on with the task variables in the population activity. Exploring further, we decoded task variables from neural activity. What we see here are cross-validated accuracies of sliding window decoders independent at each tie point along the trial. So what can we assess? First, it is reassuring that the time dynamics make sense with sensory transients, action-related post-stimulus bumps in the choice case, and so on. Secondly, we may be now better equipped to answer are trials only possible to distinguish because of a few audio or context neurons? If you look at the weights for neurons in the train decoders, there does not seem to be, say, a context-only neuron. What we see here is that coding of all task-related variables are distributed and overlapping. Another insight is that when looking at neurons ordered by orientation preference, as seen on the, on the left, it's clear that the encoding of non-visual variables uncorrelated with orientation preference. Now, let's stop for a minute and draw a picture of what exactly a logistic decoder does. So let's plot the neural activity as a vector with components by neurons, as usual. So each point represents, for example, a spike count in a single trial. Classes are the values of the binary task variables, at least in the beginning, grouping the trials. In this neural activity space, the decoder finds a direction along which the population activity differs the most between two classes. And let's call this the decision bounded normal vector, or decision vector for short, for this presentation. It is perpendicular to the separator hyperplane. The coordinates of the decision vector are the neural weights we saw in the previous slide. Now, since all independently trained decoders are maps from the vector space of neural activity, we can construct a list of bases combining any number of decoder decision vectors. For example, let's create a subspace spanned by visual and choice decision uh, vectors as bases. Remember, both of them have their own separating hyperplanes perpendicular to this new subspace. One important thing to mention is that basis vectors do not need to be orthogonal to be linearly independent. In fact, the more skewed this two-dimensional basis is, the more we move from orthogonal to linearly independent, but correlated relation. Do we expect that the orthogonality of the decodable representations reflect the dependency structure of these task variables? Let's see it in action in this choice visual subspace. It appears that the choice and the visual basis form a skewed coordinate system. We now project the activity in each trial onto this subspace. Points, here are spike counts from the first second of stimuli. Green as go signal, red as no go signal. For clearness, I plotted only the at and visual context trials here, although the decoders were trained to find directions in the whole session, including the audio context. As a sanity check, 
Separating optimally the Go and no-Go signals is indeed best done along the visual decision vector. Regarding choice, the magenta no-Go trials are in fact false alarms. The animal leaked, although it shouldn't have. You are probably wondering, where are the misses? Uh, so let's see two more animals. Now, the animals were trained to excel. So only the middle has a miss, but is well above the hit trials. A couple of other animals that also have misses, some more than one, are all qualitatively the same. An optimal cut for the choice is a horizontal line with licking below it. So it includes hits and false alarms. And with her lick above the line with correct rejections and misses. This direction is correctly identified by the choice decision vector. So yes, the dependence between sensory cues and actual choice corresponds to the skewness of the basis. Looking at it from another angle, in this attend visual context, we would reach perfect alignment if there were no mistakes. Thus, choice would collapse into the visual vector. Now, if only using these trials in this context. Okay. Now, let's move on to another subspace. This one is formed by context and visual decision vectors. Again, single trial spike counts in the first second of stimulus presentation are projected onto the subspace and the other points. Four distinct clouds appear, the two visual signals in the two contexts. Remember, the experiment is set up in a way that context and simile are independently randomized. So let's just hear them that the neural representation of visual identity are very close to orthogonal. This is similar in other mice. In fact, over all animals with accurate enough context representation, the mean is indistinguishable from orthogonal. So our latent context variable is represented in V1 activity. In a clearly defined one-dimensional subspace, orthogonal to sensory of the representation. There are many intricacies with subspaces built by three or more bases with various combinations of conditions. For the sake of time, I just mentioned that we do see expected patterns or dependencies, but we can chat about it later. So far, I've shown only activity during stimulus presentation. Now, we would explore the time course of context representation pre, on, and post stimulus. For that, let's have a look again at the context decoder accuracy along the course of the trial. What seems very striking is that in V1, a primary sensory area, context can be decoded from neural activity before and after, not just during the stimuli. So accuracy seems continuous. And this is very consistent in all 15 mice. Now, not only this is true as a distribution over subjects, but accuracy, pre, and on stimulus are highly correlated across animals. Those with low accuracy in context representation during stimulus were similarly inaccurate before the stimulus. Same with high accuracy. We controlled for the number of units available in each animal. So this gives a very cool message, actually. The strength of context representation is similar, regardless of stimulus presence. So to summarize, task variables during stimulus are represented in a low-dimensional subspace. The basis vectors of this subspace correspond to the most important population activity variabilities regarding the task conditions. Further, the orthogonality of this basis reflect the dependency structure of the binary variables describing the experimental conditions. Spontaneous activity has been linked to reflex sensory statistics, as in the Berkash article, or we've seen by labs of Ken Harris and, and Churchland last year that movement-related uh, activity shows up in subspaces orthogonal to sensory representation. Here, we show that in a context-dependent task structure, animals learn to represent context in a subspace also orthogonal to sensory representation. And not shown here, but we found that it is not explained by locomotion. And all this in V1. With that, I'd like to thank my team. It is a joint work between Paimon Gorshani's lab at UCLA doing the experiments and Gerge Orban's lab at uh, Wigner, Budapest, with theory and analysis, where we have many inspiring discussions with colleagues. So thank you very much. Uh, we have time for actually plenty of questions, thanks to outstanding planning by our speakers. Um, 
Cool, thank you very much. Um, uh, so this finding that uh, these coding spaces are like orthogonal to each other uh, in, in this particular finding is obviously well explained by the task demands. Uh, other people at uh, like Bushman lab, like uh, Matthew Panicello, have shown that like these angles like dynamically rotate depending on task demands. So there's like a changing of the encoding space in PFC. Uh, so I wonder whether you've given some thought to like the interaction of uh, like related brain areas. What does the time course tell us about this? Where does the like these changes in coding space, this orthogonalization of uh, the encoding space, come from dynamically speaking? Uh, thank you. Dynamics are really interesting. Um, first of all, these uh, these uh, vec um, decision vectors I've shown these are averages over periods during stimulus. Um, in, in this case, but we can have a look at the wobble around. Um, the other thing is there are conditions where you can compare, like just take the decision vector for the, for the choice in the, in the uh, audio context and then take in the, in the visual context, and there would be a flop between the two, for example, and lots of things. Um, I mean, this is V1, so that's the most interesting in this, I guess. Are there any more questions? Well, let's thank Marton again. Thank you. Um, while Chris is setting up, um, I will ask that people not troop out right after um, our last speaker finishes speaking. There are closing remarks and some important announcements that the organizers would like to make. So thank you. Uh, so with that, our last speaker is Dr. Chris Harvey, who's going to present some exciting findings from his lab.
say, and we need to get out of here pretty quickly. So um, I'm just gonna have a few thank yous uh, for some people who've done some incredible work um, to make this meeting a success. Um, the first person I wanna thank is my co-organizer, Surgeon. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better co-organizer to work with. I'm gonna miss our weekly Skype meetings. We might have to come up with a collaboration just so that we can continue this. Um, so thank you very much, Surgeon. I also wanna thank Leslie Weekies um, and all of her staff who did an incredible job coordinating this meeting, um, coordinating with the hotel, coordinating um, just about everything. Um, and so if you see them on the way out, wave to them, say thank you. Um, I would greatly appreciate that. I also wanna thank the hotel staff here at the Hilton, especially our AV crew back there in the corner. Thanks a lot, guys. You were awesome. Um, I want to thank the, the, there's been a lot of student volunteers that have also been running around and uh, helping out, so I want to thank you guys um, for doing that. Um, I want to thank all the people who chaired sessions uh, throughout the meeting, um, obviously the speakers, uh, you guys did a wonderful job, everybody who presented posters, um, yes, you hung in there right till the latest hours, way to go. Um, I want to thank the diversity committee who organized the luncheon and is going to organize many more events going forward, um, our executive board who oversees all of this, um, and our sponsors. Uh, the, the Gatsby Institute, uh, DeepMind, Burroughs Welcome, and the Simons Foundation. Um, and I wanna thank you all for being here um, and being such great meeting participants. Um, and uh, I really hope to see you in coming years, uh, next year in Portugal and the following year in Denver again. Um, now, final announcement. Um, there's a snowstorm coming, apparently. They would like us on the buses as soon as possible. Um, so grab your luggage, do not, uh, you know, you know, do not pass go, do whatever you need to do. Get to those buses, please. Thank you very much. The buses are available on California Street in front of the hotel.